Okay, so we concluded our socket in the previous session. So we'll continue from there. So a generic question now that would come to your mind is that we have been discussing so much about various devices, switches, network, then routers, firewalls. So when do we use what and where? The first question I would ask, like a basic question is that the device that you have in your homes that gives you the Wi-Fi ability. So what would you call that? You call it a Wi-Fi. It's a router. It's a firewall. What is the class of that device? You can unmute and speak or you can ping on the chat. Sorry, there's no wrong answer. So you can share your opinion. What do you think that device is? Okay, router. Anyone else? Okay, so router is partly right. Why? Because it is routing your traffic between both the wired and wireless. So it is performing a route, uh, just performing the role of a router, but more primarily, it's a firewall. Why? Because it blocks outside access into your network. So it's doing filtering as well. It also provides you services such as DHCP, DNS. Those services are also provided by your router. Hence, it's more of a firewall than a, compared to a router. But it is called a router because that's a term that's become more synonymous whenever it comes to Wi-Fi devices but it's more of a firewall when you go to see it in a more technical term. It's a firewall. It can do stateful inspection. It can block various ports. It can do various activities of a firewall. Mainly, it does natting. Whenever you say natting, that means that particular device is a firewall. So that's the clear distinction between a firewall and a routing device. Now, again, the question will come, how do you classify a router? A good example would be, say you have two private networks. For example, take our office itself. It has multiple flows. So if you want to route your traffic, say, from flow 6 to flow 7, so what would you put over there? Since it's the same office, you wouldn't want to filter the traffic. You would say, let all traffic go between the two flows. You do not want anything to stop. But you will say that you want to restrict maybe some servers to be blocked. So what type of device do you think I would put at this place? I would put a firewall. Firewall does do blocking, right? So this place qualifies to put a firewall. Any guesses? So at this place also, you would not put a firewall. Why? Because you're not doing packet incept, uh, inspection and neither are you doing natting. You would let the IPs flow between the two subnets. Maybe there may be two subnets or there may be the same subnet between the two flows. Ideally, they would be separated. So you would let the traffic flow freely. You would only map the two subnets together. So that's why you would mostly go with a router. A router can do IP filtering. It's not that it cannot do that. A router can do IP filtering. So you can specify what IPs should not go through the router, what IP should be blocked. What it cannot do is natting. So natting is one thing a router does not do. So that is more of a function of a firewall. So whenever you're working on firewalls, you will generally see the word natting. You would see the word throughput. Throughput, again, is a common term that would come between both firewall and routers. That is the capability of a networking device to transfer data through it. That is the processing speed. Now, again, the question would come, what is the difference between speed and throughput? So when you get, when you subscribe to an internet line, 
you are always advertise the speed of the connection so your speed could be 10 mbps 25 mbps 50 mbps maybe 100 1 gigabit so that is the speed that is being advertised that you can go up to on your given connection however the throughput will always be below this value the actual speed that you get would de depend on various factors it would depend on your router it would depend on the mode that is your cable connection how is it connected whether it's on copper whether it's on fiber whether it's wireless so there are various methods that you can have your internet connectivity all those factors also would play in then another factor mainly that would play in is the devices that are in the middle how fast they are how they are configured how good is the connectivity between them all these factors together determine your throughput any one of these factors could affect the throughput of your device so though you may have say a 100 mbps line you may still get just 50 or 25 mb because though the isp has provision for you a full 100 mb line but your throughput maybe because of your device or maybe of the poor cables provided by the isp you may not be able to get the full speed it could be anywhere there are multiple factors that affect it and yes so that's why it requires a good networking professional to identify where the issue is and then provide a fix for it so this comes to our next topic so we will discuss routers what do routers do their main function is to route traffic between subnets and also to identify where the network resources are available the main purpose would be to route the traffic from one network to another and also advertise where the how and how far are various network from that given router so now this is not generally within an organization this we are talking of global switches which are available with the isp so this is where they do the advertisement this is how they determine which ip should go where which internet traffic should go where and these are again very used switches and they work at a very fast speed they have very high throughput gigabits we are talking about over here and yes still 10 gigabits is the higher limit but they have a feature of something known as multi-teaming so where you can team multiple network adapters together so that they look as one interface thus that gives you more better speed on the network more better throughput so we are already discussing about throughput so it gives you more better throughput on a given interface now when we first connected to google if i still have my chat window open sorry my cmd open you can see over here it says the time it took for me to reach the server again these are in milliseconds not even seconds just milliseconds it doesn't mean that the server may be just in the next building it could be very far away however the network devices and the connectivity between them is much better so i'm getting a much lesser time likewise if i do a ping to yahoo.com So I get a time of 250 to 79 milliseconds. So the average time is between 278 to 79 milliseconds. Now, why is this such longer time? Another command that is very useful that the network admins generally request for is trace route. So this shows you the path to reach to a given server. Again, I'm using google.com right now here. Okay, it's got an ending IP of 46. So it's 4246. Just verifying earlier when we pinged it, what IP did it take? Sorry, this refresh is fast. Okay, let it complete. Okay, so this is showing you all the paths between my router. So my firewall, so this is my firewall device. 
that's on my end. This is the ISP firewall. So this is a public IP. And the next hops that, that is the next routers that are present in the network. You can see over also says over a maximum of 30 hops. So generally we do not see 30 hops. It's mostly lesser than that. But there could be a rare event where there may be such type of hops. So this also shows how close you are to the server. Now the closeness may not be in terms of distance. There could be a server or there could be a host that may be several thousands of kilometers far, far away but I may get lower ping time on that. So I would get a lower latency on that. However, a server may be uh, just within my city. It may be much, it would give me a much higher ping time. So that also is quite possible. So the, everything that factors in is the quality on of the devices and also the load on the devices between the server, that is the host and the guest. That is the requester. So between the two, it depends upon various factors. Okay, it's not able to get the next hop. Okay, so I have eight hops to reach to the Google server. You can see the Google server name also is something different. It doesn't say actually google.com. So this is a reverse DNS. We will cover this when we speak about DNS. So just see that the name has come different. Likewise, now if I ping Google before, I had a different IP address. I got 7746, whereas now I got Forty-two, forty-six. So I got a different IP address. Why is that so? Could be due to various reasons. Maybe this server is less occupied. So that's why I've been routed to this particular server. That server may be down for maintenance. It could be various reasons why I'm not, I've got a different server right now. So this is a reason why I said it is not necessarily that if I hit google.com later or you hit google.com, you'll see the same IP address quite possible get a different one. I'll also do the same thing for yahoo.com. Yahoo servers, I think this will be much far away. So this also, if you see on for Google, it says bomb. So this is a bomb server. That means a Mumbai server. That's why it's much closer to me, giving me a much better latency. Let's see how it is for Yahoo. Yahoo should be much far away. So mostly their servers are based in the European countries. So you can see there's a huge jump between number four hop and number five hop. So the NSG that you see over here that it says LTEL.in. This is the router which will take it to the Trans Indian Ocean cables. And then finally, it hits the Yahoo data center somewhere in the world. Okay, says US West one. Finally, it's gone to, and then it hits the server at yahoo.com. So now this again, so we are not seeing, when we hit the URL in the browser, we generally are not concerned for how many hops it takes. We just concerned with the page loading in, but this is how we troubleshoot issues on the network if we see that we are getting slowness or we are not able to reach a particular resource so these are the steps you need to follow to come to know how the traffic is getting route routed and particularly where is it getting blocked if it would not reach it would not complete the trace that means the server is not reachable the dns the ip does sorry the routers do not know where to find the server and that's also quite possible now, since we took 
famous known URL. So this thing would work for any URL that we use on the internet. Also, another thing you will notice, it checks on the IP address. It does not check on the URL. The same thing for Google also, the IP address has changed. So it is trying to reach the IP address. The URLs are dynamic, whereas IP addresses are static to a given location. Whenever you reach to any server on the internet, it's always an IP that you will reach to and not a URL. Another thing you will note over here, so yeah, these questions should come. So this is a private IP address class. So we already discussed that. And I'm saying this is my gateway. What does this become? Does this become a router? Or does this become a firewall? So this, the next hop, which is resolving into my private IP address, yes, so that again will be a firewall. It will not be a router because of the simple fact is that it is doing natting. So wherever natting comes in, it is a router. The next hop is a private IP address. Sorry, it's a public IP address. 103 is a public IP address class. So this is doing routing. Everything from here, Till the server that we see over here are public IP addresses. So this is purely routing that is going on. So these are all routers that are placed in the middle that are routing your traffic accordingly on the network. You already discussed the part of your firewall where you have network, where you have NATing specifically. That is the place where you will use firewall. Else, you will mostly use a router where you have publicly accessible resources. You can have publicly accessible resources behind a firewall also. That is what we called as reverse natting. You can configure, so there are many concepts in that. You have a DMZ, you have Bastion network. Yeah, those are more advanced topics that come behind a firewall. But just for basic knowledge, whenever you do natting, it's a firewall. Whenever you have the same when you're just routing, you're not doing any sort of filtering. That's your router. We come to the next topic, that's DHCP. So we discussed a brief about this. DHCP gives dynamic IPs to your various network resources. Now, why would you need dynamic IPs? The main reason is the ease of maintainability. So whenever, especially at you can say end users where we have devices moving in and out of an place. For example, you can say offices, end users for the end users, then where you at your homes, you would make use of DHCP so that you do not need to remember the IP address that you need to configure on a device. Whereas whenever it comes to servers, whenever it comes to enterprises, especially servers which are hosting applications and users need to connect to them. So these will always have static IPs configured on them. Mostly have static IPs currently. The reason being that on DHCP, if you're using URL, so you can configure dynamic IPs. However, the IPs change on a regular basis. And if someone has cached the IP, IPs do get cached on your machine. They could go to a server which may not be hosting the application anymore or that server may not be existing anymore. So to avoid those issues, a static IP, that is a fixed IP, is assigned to servers for the ease of connectivity. Now, a static IP can be provided by manually configuring it or static IP can also be provided by the DHCP server. Though it says it's a dynamic host protocol, it can also provide static IPs to servers. How is that done? So we already discussed this point. It is using the MAC address. So it will check the incoming request. It will check the MAC address of that particular networking device. And then it will assign the IP address to it. This is the reason why you need unique hosts that is unique mac addresses within a given network 
Now, another question that did not come before when we were discussing the MAC address is that can I have MAC addresses that are same in the same network? So previously I told no, especially because we are using DHCP, so we would get a conflict of IP address. However, if on the machine, if you're configuring static IP addresses, then yes, though you may have multiple same MAC address machines on the same network, you can configure machines having the same MAC address onto the same subnet. So that is the scenario that is supported. But if you will go with DHCP, that will cause a conflict. And definitely you will not be able to use those machines on the same network. However, complete, uh, manually configuring static IPs on the machine itself, it is possible to use machines with the same MAC address in the same network. Next, we come to the part of DNS. So DNS is a most commonly known service that we knowing unknowingly we make use of. IP addresses, we do not remember. IP addresses are too much to remember. So when you say you want to go to a facebook.com or you want to go to Instagram, Twitter, Google, you never put in an IP address of the server. You just remember its name. You go to your browser and you put in your name. You put in the URL of the site you want to visit. So this is where your DNS plays a big role. The DNS servers are responsible so this is again a protocol also that's a domain name service protocol it is responsible for converting your url that is your domain name to an ip address the networks do not understand a url they do not understand a domain name when you have to do routing it will always go on the ip address you can have any url but it will always convert to an IP address and then connect your machine. It will connect your request to the server. So I'll go back again to my machine and I will show you the IP config. So I run this IP config before. So we saw up to the subnet mask. So since this is a dynamically provided IP address, it has a lease period. So this is provided by the DHCP server on the small Wi-Fi router that I have. Even small devices, even your phones, when you share an hotspot, it turns into a firewall. Or your phone to that same Wi-Fi connection to the hotspot. You do not specify an IP address that is provided by your host device that is the device that is that has started the hotspot so it always has a lease expiration time so i have a lease expiration of three hours so after three hours it will again go and renew the lease next is the default gateway so the default gateway is already provided so we discussed this is an firewall a firewall will always have a gateway defined whereas a router does not require a gateway defined when you configure a router in the network it will do the work of routing the traffic that needs to go into the adjacent network or the configured subnets by itself you do not need to specify a gateway it is a transparent mode of transmitting the data Whereas for a firewall, you need the traffic to go through the firewall in order to go into the internet or to get routed to a different network. So you need to specify the gateway when you're using a firewall. Whereas when you configure a router, the gateway is often omitted. Then we have the DHCP server. The DHCP server is equivalent to my gateway because my firewall is also serving as a DHCP server. Likewise, when I come down, I have my DNS servers. So my DNS servers, these are the servers that provide me the name resolution. You can see my router is also present over here. 
that also provides me dns services that is name resolution services and i have three other servers that are listed over here these also provide name resolution but these are the name resolution on the internet whereas this one will provide name resolution just local to my network so if i want to connect say to a machine or to my phone over the wi-fi i can do that very well by just using the name of the machine or wi-fi so that sharing is possible because my router itself is present on the dns list so i just need to know the name of the machine the host and i'll be able to connect to it so again there's a big thing uh, there's a big note that we can write about how the routing takes place how the dns resolution takes place the, you have the root kits and you have several domain names so before it was mainly the dot com now you have several suffixes that are available you have the dot com dot net biz then you have country wise domain names so they have their own dns servers likewise they have their own registrars so you need to have your name registered with a registrar before it can be resolved over the internet this is not a free service you need to pay for this service to get a first level domain name when you say a first level domain name that means something like a google.com so that's your first level domain name a second level domain name you do get available free so on the internet there are several sites that give you second level domain names for free that may be something like say sandeep google.com so that's your second level of uh, domain name now google does not provide this service so i cannot get sandeep.google.com but there are several providers on the internet that give you this service and you can get a custom domain name for free as well because these are second level domain names someone has registered the first level one and they are providing you the service for the second level domain name so you can have free ones, but they will never be the first level domain names because that needs to be registered with the registrar. So there is a complete authority that overlooks the domain names. Just because of the reason you should not have clashes of domain name and the domain names remain unique over the internet. If you have say two google.coms, two people hosting the same site, that would create a confusion over the internet. So you would always have only one google.com so that you always go to the familiar site and no one else can misuse that so likewise you have that authority that takes care that no one can take an already registered domain name domain name renewals come at the period of one to five years so you can have any period that you want you can register a domain name for yourself So we'll talk a bit over TCP IP. So the most commonly used protocol over the internet. The TCP IP stack consists of your OSI layers. Sorry, I didn't put the picture over here. Okay, yeah, this is uh, one most relevant. So it clearly shows you how it links with your OS, ISO SI layer. So it does not omit, but it merges a couple of the layers together. So you have the data link and physical layer merged into your network interface. Your network layer is still present, transport layer is still present, and your remaining three user layers are merged into the application layer. So it does follow these standards, but it does make its own customization in that. So we need not go into the full depth of it, but these are the protocols that are supported by TCP. So you have the SMTP, FTP, Telnet. DNS uses UDP. DNS uses both UDP and TCP these days. SNP uses UDP. TFTP uses uh, yeah, this also uses TCP itself. Then on the network layer, we discussed ICMP. So this is basically your ping. ARP and RAP, they are your address resolution protocols. So the DNS that we were discussing. 
So an address to resolution you use ARP and when you need to do the reverse that is when you have an IP address that you want to convert into a URL that is your domain name then at that time we use an RARP that is your reverse address resolution protocol. So you don't need to remember all these things because these are mostly taken care by your application. But while troubleshooting, sometimes you need to know what all things are going on in the background on the network. So now coming to our HTTP, HTTPS. So these are the most, this is the most common protocol that used on the internet. Majority of the firewalls, routers, across the world would have http https ports open apart from this they will also have the udp port of 53 open what is the udp port of 53 that's your dns resolution port if that port is blocked yes your http https also will never work so you require your dns port open then you require your HTTP and HTTPS ports also open on your firewall and routers so that your network traffic can connect to the server. First of all, resolve the name of the server and then finally, finally create a socket and connect to the respective server. So apart from having your port 80, your port 443, you also have your DNS server port, that's port 53 that is always open now these are standard ports they do not change dns is fixed to 53 you will always host a dns server on port 53 likewise a publicly accessible http and https site you would host on a port 80 and port 443 but it does not limit you from hosting this website on different ports so every browser does support connecting to defined ports. So then the question will come, why do we keep a standard? It's mainly because of the reason that you do not want people to guess what port you need to access to. We have 65,386 ports available on a machine. If a user needs to get guess on which port the web server is running it's tedious so no user would then access that particular website so for internal development or maybe for private sites for organizational sites it's okay to define a port number but if you need people to publicly connect to a web server you would want to host it on the port 80 or port 443 so port 80 is your unencrypted port. That is your default HTTP port. Port HTTPS. So the 443 port is your SSL port. Now both would connect to your same server. Both would be running on the same server mostly. And the encryption would be taken care on your server. Now coming in one more step ahead. So when we talk about networking, load balancers, or an other major aspect of networking. Now, what is the purpose of a load balancer? I know this should be a very fairly common topic. So you can tell me what are the benefits or the purpose of a load balancer? Guesses? Okay, so as the name says, it's a load balancer. So that's the first thing that will come to your mind. It is a load balancer. So no doubt about that. It will do load balancing. Now the next question should come to your mind is, how does it do load balancing? How does it know how much the server is consuming? How does it know which traffic should go where? Correct. So that should be the next question. So what load balancing does is that it does not connect to any of the servers. So not necessarily connect to any servers in the pool. So first of all, to configure a load balancer, you need is a front end IP address. That is where 
your requests come in. Now you see I told front end IP address. I did not specify whether it needs to be a private IP address or a public IP address. It could be either. So you're not limiting your load balancer to only internal load balancing. It could also be public facing load balancing. Secondly, you need a pool of services. When you say a pool of services, it could be, they should be like services or they should be the mostly the same service that you're going to serve. If there are different services that you're putting within the pool, so every user would get a different experience. So whenever you're doing a load balancing, it's always the same service or the application that you would that you would uh, configure on the load balancer. You would never configure different applications using the same, same front end pool. So there are scenarios where you also configure different applications, but then you would, they are load balancers that where you can define multiple rules on them. So there are various scenarios, but we'll take a more simpler scenario where you have a front end IP address, you have back end pools. Now here again, the concept of socket comes into play. Load balancer can have several ports configured. Most common port that you would use is your port 80 and port 443. Load balancers can again be used to balance network traffic. That is your web traffic. You can also use to balance your, say, SQL server traffic. Any other application traffic that you require high availability. So you can use load balancers for them. Now I've introduced a new term that is high availability. So load balancers provide you high availability. Pardon me if my spelling is wrong. So it also provides you high availability. It also provides you fault tolerance. Now again, this depends on load balancers. Some load balancers do not probe the backend pool. So if the probe is not available, it will still send the request to a server that is not able to handle request. So at that time you may see outages. So high availability does not mean fault tolerance. Fault tolerance does not mean high availability. So they are both ways. So to have fault tolerance, you need to have a probe that will check whether the service is running or not. So this also along with high availability, provides you fault tolerance. How does it do that fault tolerance? It will basically try reaching your site from the load balancers and see that it is available. The moment it sees it down, it will remove it from the pool and not route any new traffic to that particular server. Also, any existing traffic that was going to the server, it will move it to the other servers in the pool so that the users do not notice an outage. Next, how does it do the load actual load balancing? So it does load balancing depending upon the algorithm that is configured. So it's not like a, a random assignment that request one goes to server one, request one goes to server one, two goes to server two, three goes back to server one. So you specify a algorithm. The most famous algorithm that you use is round robin. So that each server in the pool would get connection depending upon the server, the requests that come in. You also have first serve, first out. So it depends completely on what algorithm that you select. So the algorithms on most load balancers are configurable. However, still your load balancers do not know. It could be possible that once the request may take a huge amount of load and maybe a second request though may be very low, may go onto a second server. Then again, the third request which may go on server one would be very heavy. So load balancer does not know the load on the server. Most load balancers do not connect to these servers and see what is the exact load to do load balancing. 
So though the name is load balancing, it does not check the physical, it does not check the load on the actual backend pool. It just checks for the availability and then accordingly does the routing. There are several load balancers that are coming out these days that do check the resources on the device pool that is on the backend pool, but they are still very rare, very less used. Obviously, they, this will add to cost. So anything that gives you more better performance, will give you more better features are more expensive. The most commonly used ones are the algo based load balancers so that it can be maintained in a more easier way. And the new load balancers come with layer seven load balancers. So nowadays you also get layer seven load balancers. So when you go with, uh, say, a network load balancer, that is a load balancer that works at, uh, say, for your SQL server or for any other services, but a more generic one, that will mostly be a layer three load balancer, which can route any service that works on TCP. Whereas if you go towards a more advanced load balancer, so load balancers nowadays also have a inbuilt firewall. They can do stateful inspection, what type of traffic is coming in, what type of data is going out. So that's called your stateful inspection. So these type of load balancers, they are layer seven load balancers. So they run at your application level on the OSI chart. These load balancers, load balancers are also capable of SSL offloading. What does that mean? Is that your backend pool could run on an HTTP port. It could be a default 80 port or any customized port. It could be like a port 8080, port 9000, but running an HTTP web server. And your users would connect to the server on HTTPS. On port 443, the natting, or you can say the route, the natting that is done, the SSL offloading more clearly that is done, is done on the load balancer, where it would encrypt the data on the load balancer and then provide it to the end user. Likewise, the incoming data would be decrypted on the load balancer itself and then be transmitted to the backend pool. So the load balancer would take care of the encryption and decryption of the data with the certificate that is providing you the HTTPS functionality. Whereas the internal communication, which would be mostly on a private network would run on HTTP protocol itself. So thus, this also reduces the load on your backend pool while offloading the task of encryption description and the SSL offloading to the load balancers. So now again, yeah, so there are many type of load balancers, application load balancers available. You can definitely configure several rules on a single load balancer. So it's not mandatory that you have only one URL on per load balancer. Modern load balancers can host multiple URLs on them. They can host, host multiple IPs on them. So now the possibilities are endless. So you are getting good hardware that can actually do that. So that reduces the cost for the organization. So they don't need to buy multiple load balancers. They don't need to have the space to host multiple load balancers in their environment. One load balancer is capable of hosting several websites and also do the load balancing in an efficient way. Yes, definitely the cost for these type of load balancers are more expensive than the traditional IP based load balancers. So also now this can be done both maybe for your internal network. You can do it for your private IP addresses. You can also do it for your external network. You can do it for public IP addresses. Now, when it comes to a load balancer, you would mostly have a front end public IP address and your backend pool, that is all your backend servers that it would be hosting, that would mostly be on private IP addresses. So what is the other function does your load balancer perform? 
Can anyone guess? Remember, the front end is your public IP address. Your back end is on private IP address. What did we discuss earlier in the session? What is a device that does this? A guess? Okay, so this also serves as a firewall. Why? Because this is going to do natting again. It's going to inspect your traffic. It's going to put restrictions on your traffic. It's going to change your internal port to a different port. So we had discussed about reverse natting. So this will be doing your reverse natting on the load balancing device. So this is not a router. This functions like a firewall. So any questions? Okay, so this was the last topic I had on this. So we are open for q and I know I've not covered many things on networking. Networking is a very huge topic. So you have any questions, anything specifically that you want to know about, yet yeah, definitely we can discuss about that. Any questions? Okay, so one of the topics I can think of we did not discuss was VPN. So where does your VPN play a role? So would a VPN device be a router or a firewall? The first question I would start from there. What do you think? So a VPN device would mainly connect give you connectivity from a public network to your private network so our office internal networks would be a private network whereas the external network from where you're connecting from your home though your home network internally is private but you need to travel over the internet so this is again a public to private conversion so your vpn device would again act as a firewall it will do the filtering it would decide on what you can access, what you cannot access. So all that things are again taken care of by the VPN device. And it also plays the role of a firewall. We always remember whenever you create a VPN de device, you connect to a VPN, it always has rules. What you can connect, what you cannot connect. Likewise, when you connect to your office network, you see that many websites are blocked. So you cannot browse many things. It's not, that's not because of your VPN. The VPN is just letting you into the network, but then the office network itself has its own firewall. So that firewall is filtering your network. But when you connect into your office network, you can then connect to InfoWeb. That is something you cannot connect on your open network. That's because the InfoWeb server is hosted within the IT network of LearningMet. It's not anywhere out. So you cannot connect it from outside. Though you have the URL, when you ping the particular URL, that is your infoweb.learningmate.com, it does resolve. But it's hosted only internal to the network. It's not hosted outside on the public network. So because of that, we cannot connect to it. Only when we connect on the VPN. The VPN device knows the IP address of the server that is hosting the website and it automatically takes us over there. So that is how your VPN works. It creates a tunnel between your device, between two devices. So it's not necessarily a Windows machine, not necessarily a laptop. It could be a mobile phone. It could be a... Wi-Fi router, it could be anything. So it could be between any two devices that you could set up a VPN connection. And a VPN connection is not many to many. It's mostly one-to-one -one that you create. So it's always one-to-one. Uh, -one, or it could be many-to-one. But the connection that you would be sharing with a VPN de device is always one connection with one host. So you would always have your individual encryption keys that would not be the same to other people. 
So you encrypt your data is always encrypted uniquely. So that's what that's why I told it's one to one. Though we say, you may say that many people connect to the Learning Mate VPN, so that is many to one. But however, the connection that you establish, it's one to one. That is your device to the Learning Mate VPN server. So that's always going to be one to one. You cannot create a connection to two Learning Mate VPN servers. If there is a primary and a secondary, it will never do two connections. You will always have only one connection that is from your device to the server. So there are other setups also that nowadays is evolving where you can have multiple VPN servers set up for better redundancy and high availability. So those setups are coming up, but those again would be on a completely different IP having different keys to connect. So again, that is one to one, but the connectivity it will provide seamless because if one network goes down, the other VPN tunnel will take it over. It will be both are completely independent of each other. So those are the type of VPN tunnels that are supported. But you're mostly whenever you configure VPN tunnel, it's always one to one. Okay, any questions? You can ask any networking questions. So I do not know in much deep, but I'll do my best to address those questions. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, so then all the best. You can always post your questions on the 